tense uh, here and there through the uh, group, so you'll have an idea of what I'm thinking about, <clears throat> though I will be talking about something a little different than it's on that contents. <clears throat> Every once in a while, after I finished uh, Rough Stone Rolling, someone would ask, uh, what's next? Another book on Joseph Smith? Are you moving on to Brigham Young? What? And I had no answer until suddenly, about a year ago, there flashed into my mind the idea of writing a book about the gold plates. And at first I thought you could say about all you need to know about the gold plates in two and a half pages. But as I thought more about it and began to talk to my wife Claudia, it soon was evident it was a very complicated subject. And I've handed out this table of contents, tentative table of contents, to give you an idea of the dimensions of a cultural history of the gold plates. Thinking about it, I also began to realize the breadth and reach of this subject, <clears throat> really far beyond my own poor powers to encompass. And so the table of contents is a way as an invitation to uh, any of you who have an interest or have done research on the gold plates to contribute your thoughts. Jerry Ainsworth just uh, generously gave me a copy of his book on the Book of Mormon, and I immediately eyed down through the table of contents, and there was a chapter on the gold plates. So I went there and found lots of stuff, and I found an excellent article uh, on the BMF uh, website on the gold plates. So there's a lot to be learned, and I'd be very pleased uh, to talk to any of you who have an interest in this subject. The um, selection of the gold plates topic was not a result of reflection or deliberation of any kind. It just thrust itself upon me. And that may be the way with the gold plates. They thrust themselves upon us. The Book of Mormon never says that the plates Nephi made and that Mormon wrote on were made of gold. There were brass plates and the 24 gold plates of ether, but no description of the material of Nephi's plates other than they were made of, from ore. According to Joseph Smith, Moroni described them as gold during his visit, and so did the witnesses, as we know, but Joseph Smith himself usually referred to them as plates or the record. His mother did the same. She only said gold plates when she was speaking of the way outsiders referred to them. But even though gold was downplayed in the book's own story, the very first newspaper article on the Mormon movement spoke of the gold Bible. And that term recurred over and over again in accounts of Mormonism and the Book of Mormon. The words gold Bible appear in bold type on the title page of E.D. Howe's 1834 Mormonism Unveiled. They turned up again in the episode on Mormonism in South Park and they play a pivotal role in Tony Kushner's Angels in America, the Pulitzer Prize-winning drama that features Mormons so prominently. The gold plates are simply too memorable and too exotic to be overlooked. They live on in the imagination, even of people who do not believe they ever existed. Mormons believe that Joseph Smith uh, possessed the plates for at most 21 months, and yet they have fixed themselves in our imaginations. None of us have ever seen the plates, but how many replicas of the plates have you seen? One rendition sits in the library of the Maxwell Institute at, at BYU, big, heavy, metal version of the plates. 
Another replica is featured in the glassed-in display of the Joseph Smith Building at BYU, along with the Sword of Laban and a model of the Liahona. Our bulletin board in the Pasadena Ward where I attend has three pictures of Joseph Smith translating the plates. A recent opera produced at BYU on Joseph Smith's early, early life was titled Book of Gold. They are a luminous, magnetic, irresistible object in Mormon history and lore. In a sense, the plates are a touchstone of Mormon belief. Christians sometimes test the orthodoxy of other Christians by asking if you believe in the virgin birth. In the same manner, anyone who says they believe in the reality of the gold plates qualifies as a believing Mormon. The plates are also central to the characterization of Joseph Smith. Traditionally, the great question has been, was he sincere or was he a fraud? And the gold plates are the hinge on which that issue turns. In the minds of outside observers, the plates weigh far more heavily than the first vision. Had Joseph Smith only seen visions, he could have been classed with Cotton Mather, Charles G. Finney, Ellen G. White, Ann Lee, and scores of others who saw visions in his time, along with hundreds of other visionaries down through the, the ages. Skeptics know how to account for visions. They invoke the psychological and the cultural. A rationalist can believe that a visionary sincerely believes in his visions, though the skeptic himself finds other explanations. Doubters can't so easily accept the Joseph Smith who brought home gold plates. They are material, not visionary and psychological. They invade the world of the senses and of ordinary common experience. They make the claim that the supernatural has entered the natural world. If you don't believe in the supernatural, they are impossible. Skeptics can only consider the stories of hiding the plates, wrapping the plates, showing the plates, translating from the plates as a fraudulent effort to turn a pretense into a reality, like a beggar claiming to have a diamond that he allows no one to see. That kind of creation seems like the work of an imposter, not a visionary. The plates are the basis in Dan Vogel's mind, for example, for concluding that Joseph Smith was a pious fraud. In the accounts of the unbelieving, Joseph's initial deception involving the plates casts a long shadow of prevarication over his entire life. On the other hand, if the plates are a fatal flaw in Joseph Smith's story, they are also the basis for the most convincing evidence of his authenticity. Joseph, or the Lord, came closest to offering concrete evidence of supernatural intervention in the provision for witnesses of the plates. Joseph showed the plates to 11 people and pointedly printed their statements in the Book of Mormon. Their testimony was the answer to skeptics. For the most part, he avoided trying to prove his claims. In general, he just stayed away from that. But with the plates, he presented direct courtroom-style evidence, in effect, legal depositions. So in the plates, we have joined the two characterizations of Joseph Smith the fraud and the prophet, with plates as the hinge between the two. This material proof for unbelievable claims causes them to hover on the boundary between chicanery and rationality, fantasy and reality. In keeping with their habit of intruding and disrupting, Joseph Smith's gold plates challenge our understanding of history, too, 
and that is what I wish to speak of today. I believe the plates cause us to reevaluate history as it is known to modern scholarship. By thrusting themselves into our views, the plates require us to reorient ourselves to historical reality. And tonight, I wish, or this morning, I guess, I thought I was going to speak in the evening at first. And I wish to discuss two historical challenges, one to ancient history and the other to modern history. The plates put the ancient world, especially the 17th century Jerusalem in which Lehi prophesied, in a new light. They do so by their creation and their very existence. For what the plate stands for is the immense importance of history writing and record keeping in the time of Lehi and Nephi. As we all know, the Book of Mormon is all about the writing of histories. It opens with Nephi talking about records. I, Nephi, being born of good parents, goodly parents, etc., Therefore, I make a record of my proceedings. In verse 2, he talks about language. I make a record in the language of my father, which consists of the learning of the Jews and the language of the Egyptians. Before he gets into the story at all, Nephi tells you about making a record in the language he will use. Nephi began this record 20 or 30 years after the departure of Lehi's family from Jerusalem at the point when he had separated from his brothers. First Nephi clearly was written to explain and justify the separation of the Nephites from the Lamanites. His writings up through 2 Nephi 5 are a lengthy justification for taking over the leadership of Lehi's family and taking control of Lehi's record. The break was so painful and so contested that for centuries, it festered in Lamanite memory. Lamanite generals could stir their people up to war by reminding them of the injustices inflicted by Nephi and his brothers in claiming leadership. Nephi wrote his history as a rejoinder to the Lamanite story. The remarkable thing is that he began this record on what we call small plates despite the fact that his father kept a record of his own. Moreover, Nephi himself was already keeping another record, a political history of his time. The three records covered much of the same ground, and yet all had to be kept, so Nephi believed. It suggests the religious importance and polit political significance of writing history. The plates put record keeping at the very center of both politics and religion. Record keeping Nephite style, moreover, was not an enterprise to be taken lightly. It required the smelting of ore, the fashioning of plates. It was an arduous task to engrave the characters on these plates, as the writers sometimes complained. Moreover, the script they chose to write in was out of the ordinary. They wrote in Hebrew using Egyptian characters that was probably not the script in which letters were written or King Benjamin's speech was recorded. It was a language for high sacred enterprises requiring special training before use. Nephi and Lehi were not the only ones to keep records. Nephi's brother Jacob did the same and then down through time one person after another. Zenith the willful Nephite who sought to recover his people's native land also kept a record. Alma started a record of his people as soon as he separated from Noah. It seemed to be customary for the leader of each group to keep a record, many of them on metal plates, despite the difficulty of manufacture. With this record-keeping impulse so strong in the band that left Jerusalem, strong enough to establish a tradition that lasted a thousand years, we have to ask, where did this compulsion come from? Why was record-keeping so critical to the Nephites? 
Not everyone who left Jerusalem at the time of the Babylonian captivity was so driven. Not the Mulekites, who took no records with them and kept none themselves. Not the Lamanites, so far as we know. But the Nephites more than made up for these lapses. Nephi and the company of record keepers thus forces us to ask, what was the state of record keeping and history making in Jerusalem in the 7th century BCE? Did anything in Nephi's environment spark the record keeping in impulse? Can we find evidence of this powerful project among the literate classes of that culture? Or was this focus distinctive to Nephi's little branch of Israel, inspired perhaps by their call to seek another promised land? These questions are so pressing, the Neo A. Maxwell Institute is planning a conference for 2012, their biennial symposium, in which we will invite the best experts we can find to explore these questions with us. Moreover, the Mormon Scholars Foundation is sponsoring summer seminars in 2011 and 2012 on the gold plates. Although information about writing and history in the, 17th century, in the seventh century is still unfolding, we can draw a few conclusions about the state of history writing in Jerusalem at that period. I won't attempt a full summary of knowledge on this subject. The Maxwell Institute Conference will do that. But I believe a few tentative conclusions can be drawn about Nephi's record and the state of record keeping in Jerusalem. Perhaps the most clear is that Nephi's practice of merging languages, Hebrew and Egyptian, had many precedents. At the time of the Book of Mormon's publication, the idea of reformed Egyptian only invited ridicule. But now we know that it was fairly commonplace for groups with a spoken language but no script to borrow an established script. As Albertine Garr in his History of Writing puts it, the most remarkable disregard for the writing language connection shows itself in the way a script designed for one particular language is at times adopted for the use of another totally different language. Canaanites writers first borrowed Egyptian hieroglyphics, hieroglyphs to write their spoken language. Phoenicians did the same. Hebrew writing, in turn, developed out of Canaanite, each group borrowing from its predecessor. In retrospect, it seems quite obvious that a non-literate people with a spoken language would borrow script when they needed uh, one for a written version of their language. Script borrowing also occurred when one culture merged with another. The Ptolemies, the Egyptian rulers for many centuries, wrote Egyptian in Greek, which was sensible for a regime that was heavily under the influence of the Greeks. By the same token, Yiddish is German, written with Hebrew letters. There are many reasons for the merger of languages, and we don't know exactly which one applies to the Nephites. Did they write their Hebrew in Egyptian characters merely to compress the writing, as there are hints in the Book of Mormon? Considering the difficulty of making and writing on plates, it would make sense to compact the writing as much as possible. But was the selection of Egyptian also a mark of the heavy Egyptian influence on Jerusalem in the seventh century? It would be like Romaji, the Japanese use of Roman letters to write Japanese. The more commonly known kanji is Japanese written in Chinese characters, a practice that started when Japanese lacked a script of their own. Both seem to stem from the influence of a powerful neighboring culture and to represent an effort to blend those cultures. We may see in Nephi's choice of languages the permanent influence of Egypt on Palestine in Lehi's time. But if the merged, sense, uh, if the merged language 
of Nephi's record makes sense in the seventh century. What about his constitution, his construction of metal plates, such as, or of Laban's brass plates? Were Israelites writing on metal plates in the fashion of Nephi and his compatriots? The Israelites knew how to work uh, what the Bible calls brass, but what we know must have been bronze, a copper with a tin alloy. The Bible even mentions brass plates, but these were structural elements in Solomon's temple, not writing surfaces. Most writing in the per period was done on papyrus with a brush or inscribed on clay tablets or pots. Parchment made of stretched skins would not be invented for another four centuries, though there was a little writing on leather. In view of the preponderance of papyrus and clay, was there any writing on metal plates? Could Nephi have brought that technology and practice with him from his homeland? There is no question that ancient peoples wrote on metal. Examples have been found from the 18th century BCE. The scriptions memorialized the reign of kings, marked the construction of great buildings, or recorded a significant diplomatic agreement. These metal objects have turned up in many places in Near Eastern antiquity, especially in Assyria and Mesopotamia, and later in Egypt. The Bulgarian National Museum of History contains a small Etruscan book from Lehi's time period consisting of six pages, two by two inches, bound with metal rings. Exodus 28, 36 states that thou, sh quote, thou shalt make a plate of pure gold, engrave upon it holiness to the Lord. So there are examples of writing on metal plates, but all of the examples we have found thus far circle around the gold plate challenge without quite meeting it. We do not have writing on metal plates in the ancient Near East. We do have writing on metal plates in the ancient Near East, but what we lack so far is lengthy, detailed, historical writing on metal plates. There were inscriptions, like the great prayer of Israel, the Shema, oh, uh, oh, hero Israel. That one was found in Austria, written on plates, and there were law codes on metal, but not long histories. Probably because of the expense, metal was used for brief, highly valued records, not for lengthy prophetic or historical writing. In his account of the relative, relatively unusual use of metal as a medium, Gar says, precious metals, gold and silver, were mostly employed to stress the value of a particular text, to show respect when sending a letter or a message to a person of exceptionally high rank, or last but not least, to draw attention to one's own wealth and social standing. Were there, however, full-fledged histories on plates? None so far. The closest were the lists of royal achievements in Assyrian metal plates that bordered on history. In my opinion, our search for histories on metal plates, we need also to look for the preconditioning mindset that preceded the production of such an artifact. Histories on plates would not flourish until writers had adopted a certain attitude toward record keeping. They had to want their texts to endure. Biblical scholars today cannot get back to the seventh century Israel because the papyrus on which texts were written has not survived, save in special conditions like those in the, of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Writers of that period apparently did not take measures to guarantee preservation. 
The Book of Mormon writers, by contrast, worried about the decay of their writings and acted to prevent it by writing on metal. Did any biblical writers have that same concern about durability? The emergence of historical mentality and the use of metal as a medium must have developed together. The motivation to write history must have been linked to the desire to preserve the past for future generations. People do not go to all the trouble to write a history to keep a record unless they are striving to influence future readers. That was certainly Nephi's aim, and all Book of Mormon authors for that matter. Only when you write for the generations to come does the question of enduring materials force itself upon you. An investment in the future makes the extreme effort to produce and write on metal plates reasonable. It presumes, moreover, a sense of the continuing stream of history. What transpires now comes out of the past and flows into the future. It requires a sense, in other words, of being part of historical continuum. That is what we want to look for in the 17th century Jerusalem as a prelude to writing on metal. It's not unlikely that we'll find it there. Historical writing was beginning to emerge in this period, if not on metal plates. Evidence exists of histories written as early as David's reign in the 10th century BCE. The 7th century BCE is the century of Lehi's early, the century of Lehi's early life is notable for the emergence of the great <coughs> biblical histories. The debate continues over when 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings were written down. Many say only after the Babylonian captivity, but others credibly assert that much was written just before the Babylonian exi exile in Lehi's century, the 7th century. Elsewhere in the broader region, this is a time when oral histories passed down from sage to sage, bard to bard, were finally written down. The Homeric epics were reduced to writing in this period. The epic of Gilgamesh, honoring the exploits of a Mesopotamian hero king century earlier, was recorded on 12 clay tablets in the 7th century BCE. History writing was in the air in the Near East. Why not in Jerusalem, too? All of these questions, in my opinion, arise out of the gold plates. Because we believe in gold plates engraved with an ancient history, our approach to the past takes a certain form. The plates lead to inquiries that may go against the grain of current historical scholarship. If pursued, however, they have the potential of enriching our understanding of Israel in this era, and just as important, of giving us a better picture of where the Book of Mormon fits into antiquity. Mormon scholars must cheer this kind of research, and even more important, enter into it themselves. I believe the Maxwell Institute Conference will advance this effort. Sorry, I'm smoking up here. Are you still there? <laughs> What about the gold plates challenge to modern history? How do the plates disrupt the world we live in today? I will sum up my point at the outset by saying that if it was known for sure by everyone that the plates existed, they could, in, in theory, turn the course of history as it has developed over the last three centuries under the overarching rubric of secularization. It is possible, if not entirely probable, that modern history would take another direction. Modern history is notable for the emergence of what the philosopher Charles Taylor calls the secular age. 300 years ago, Taylor says, everyone assumed there was a God and supernatural powers at work in the world. That was the starting point for everyone. Only a tiny minority 
departed from this prevailing belief. Now, everyone knows that the existence of God is in constant question. No one can assume that everyone will believe. Faith has to assert itself against a background of prevailing doubt. That is the starting point against which believers in the transcendent must make their claims. The prevailing secular outlook grows out of what Taylor calls the imminent frame. By imminent, he means the belief that things all around us come out of ordinary experience, those things that are near to us versus those things that are transcendent beyond this sphere of existence. Within the imminent frame, all events can be explained psychologically or historically. If we have a vision, it can be shown to stem from some factor in our inner makeup that has led us to believe we saw an angel or the face of God. Not an actual angel or a divine influence from heaven, but something within us. Everything that happens is a result of some immediate cause in our society. We're all enmeshed, you could say, trapped in history. All these immediate or imminent causes stand in contrast to the idea that events may be the result of transcendent causes. In the secular age, everything has a natural explanation. Nothing is supernatural. The parting of the Red Sea can be explained by powerful winds uh, dividing the waters or by the wishful thinking of later Israelites who made up the story to justify their origins as a people. Anything but the transcendent power of God acting upon the sea. There are those in the secular age who still open themselves to the transcendent against the prevailing dominance of imminent explanation, but the burden of proof lies on them. The transcendent cannot be assumed as it once was. In the secular age, the existence of the supernatural is always in question. The gold plates stand against this prevailing view. They claim to be a marker from a supernatural realm. They testify by their very existence that there are invisible powers beyond our sphere, angels, prophets, miraculous translations. Think of a dream about an angel who promises the dreamer peace and happiness and gives the person in his dream an intricately carved ring set with a pearl as, as a token. The dreamer awakes happy but instantly doubtful and then spies the very ring sitting on the night table. Could it be the dream was actually true? Was there an angel? The ring is a token of the dream's reality. We do not have the plates in our hands like the dreamer holds the ring, but 12 men saw the plates. That causes us to pause. How could it be? Surely there was not a real angel out of heaven or real plates. That entails so much. Another sphere beyond the imminent frame. If Joseph had the plates, it was like the fairy had left a ring on his night table. We would have a palpable token of the supernatural. All that had been discounted and dismissed in the secular age would suddenly enter into the mundane world like a visitor from space. That is why I say the gold plates seek to turn around the course of secularization. They testify of the supernatural world that moderns have cast aside in favor of pure eminence. Could this tiny item possibly bend the whole world? It seems unlikely. It would be like trying to raise the earth on a fulcrum with a single plank. The plank is likely to break before the earth rises. But then the record itself insists that by small things, great things may be accomplished. At the very least, the plates can prop open the imminent frame that encases all of us. 
It evokes the possibility that powers operate beyond the immediate and the ordinary. It allows us to peek into a world of angels, prophets, and divine power. Finally this morning, I invite you to reflect on the gold plates as emblem. They are a token of God entering history, like Moses parting the Red Sea or Christ's resurrection. Anyone who believes in gold plates is close to being a Mormon. They are therefore not just a curiosity. They are, as I say, an emblem. And what does that emblem signify to us? Think of other eminent religious emblems and what they signify. The Red Sea stands for Jehovah delivering Israel. The event is a testament to God's covenant with his people. The resurrection, a great Christian emblem, is a promise of the hope that death may be conquered. It offers new life. It is a compelling and rich event, replete with ever renewed meaning. What about the gold plates? What do they stand for? I would like to run my hands over the plates, to heft them, to let my eyes play upon the subtle, shifting gold and brass color. Probably they were annealed, that is, heated and cooled many times to toughen the metal, and then pounded into thin sheets like tin. They may have been a copper and gold alloy, with the copper hammered away so the gold sheen shows through. This is how they made tumbaga, the ancient Indian metal, worked in South and Central America. What would it suggest itself if you looked upon this sacred object? I think I would be impressed with their antiquity. They were old. The metal had endured many centuries. You could sense hovering over the plates all the hands that engraved those pages. Nephi, Jacob, Enos, Jaron, Omni, Chemish, Mormon, Moroni. They were the work of generations of prophets. The plates became the emblem of an entire civilization, not just a single person. They had absorbed vast stretches of human experience as if moved through the hands as as they moved through the hands and minds of the engravers onto their figured metal surfaces. And what was the experience embedded in those plates? It was of a people led by men who saw themselves battling for their people, pleading, harassing, molding, hammering those people into a people of God. These prophets always thought in terms of peoples, the group, the nation, Israel. It was the redemption of Israel they longed for. Book of Mormon prophets lived in a national consciousness, not for themselves or their families alone. They were religious patriots who willingly lived and died for Israel's redemption. And what about the gold? That the engravings were made on gold plates means the history of these people is not only precious, but meant to endure. It has to endure. Otherwise, these peoples lived and died in vain. At the end, Moroni pleads with his readers to take the plates seriously. I would exhort you that you would ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. Otherwise, his people, their lives and deaths, and the laboriously engraven plates would come to naught. The plates insisted that the histories of people, their wrestles with God, and their struggles with each other must be given heed. Such histories instruct and inspire not only their triumphs, but their defeats and failures as well. They say we must learn from each other we come to know God through prophetic words to people like these and through their experience in living with, by, and against God's words. 
This is where we encounter God ourselves in these sacred histories. Through these things, God will show forth his power to future generations. That, in my view, is the emblematic of the gold plates. They speak of the brotherhood and sisterhood of all humans, each people living out its history, each one wrestling with the divine light given them, each digesting and recording what they have learned from this life, each people making its contribution to the whole, each learning from the others. The story of a people written in gold, an appealing emblem, I think, for this particular moment in world history. Thank you. I believe I'm uh, supposed to invite questions, and uh, um, I'm not even going to promise answers. I've, as I've said, I'm over my head in this subject, but I'd be very interested in hearing your reactions and thoughts. And um, since Joseph Smith was deeply involved in the gold plate story, any questions you'd like to raise about uh, Joseph Smith? Michael. It's, it's an issue. You probably heard the question. There are people who say that Book of Mormon certainly is an inspired and inspiring book, but the backstory of the plates and the translation is probably uh, or is irrelevant to it. They dismiss it. What would we uh, gain and lose? What we would would lose would be a powerful uh, form of evidence that the Lord gave to Joseph Smith and to us of the actuality of all these experiences, and therefore the actuality of the transcendent sphere. In giving it away, we are in effect um, expressing a willingness to live within the imminent sphere, where everything is just what happens around us. There's the book. We get inspired by it, but not necessarily anything beyond. So. Uh, I'm very tolerant of those people. I think anyone who holds on to the words of God uh, sincerely and devotedly, that is, benefits from them, is on the right track. But I myself think that, that would be gutting some of the, of the most gritty and appealing parts of the Mormon story. Yeah. Yeah, I think Hebrew was a, it was the language of uh, Israel in that time. Aramaic comes in uh, in later. Um, I don't want to speak authoritatively on these these things, but that is certainly my my impression. You're saying they'd be easier to engrave than Egyptian. Yeah. I'm not sure easy is a word that makes a lot of difference to them. They, they're going to extreme lengths. And as we know, this, having a special language uh, is a meant, meant to elevate the text. There are these hierotic languages in, in Egyptian which are priestly languages. They're meant to be the record of holy and sacred things. And um, exertion, I mean, efficiency is not the name of their game. They're willing to exert themselves uh, tremendously to do all these things. It's an interesting question, though. I'm going to keep that one in mind. Long story. The question is, uh, how were the Book of Moses um, preserved? 
Well, um, there's a lot of debate, and that will have to come out in our conference. One theory is that it's oral for many, many centuries, as were the Homeric epics and so on, and sort of preserved just in human memory. And then finally, the time comes when they write it down. And uh, as I say, there are evidences of that in David's time, more evidence of it in the seventh century. That may be the moment when we're precipitating written accounts out of this, uh, this oral culture. And then, of course, they're lost, and we don't, the earliest manuscripts we have of the Bible, except for the Dead Sea Scrolls and a few scraps here and there, are um, ninth and 10th centuries in the Christian era. So uh, there's, it, it's a very scant textual documentary trail that leads back to the Bible. Yes? I've often said the Book of Mormon is a book about the importance of books. I mean, I, I mean, here he has to subvert his own conscience, his own morality, in order to obtain that that record. Um, it's, it's certainly a tribute to the absolutely essential nature of that record. But then, all the way through, the idea that bringing this Book of Mormon forth is going to introduce a new dispensation. It's going to change the course of history. That's putting a lot of weight on a printed text. So yes, indeed, it is an importance of writing. You mean other than the fact they say this is what they're doing? Well, where do they, they don't, where do they say that they're writing in Hebrew with Egyptian? He's talking about the learning of the Jews, but they're using the language of the Egyptian. Uh-huh. But uh, I'm not familiar with the passage where they actually say they're writing in, they're recording the Hebrew language using Egyptian script. Uh-huh. Um, well, what do you, language do you think... Um, um, Lehi and Nephi used as they ate breakfast together each morning. Possibly, I, I mean, we assume Hebrew, but it just seems strange to me that they're always uh, recording the, I mean, even that they're that familiar with the language of the Egyptians. I mean, we, we, yeah. I, well, it's a very good question. I'm sure you would have a better answer for it than, than I, I could. It's just that when we move Outside of the Book of Mormon record, there are so many examples of, these, of this scripted exchange. Um, I had this interesting experience um, talking to an Egyptologist um, about um, the Book of Abraham and um, the Book of Moses, and more specifically about the Anthon transcript. Was it actually Egyptian? This was... Um, guy named Richard Parker at Brown University. And um, uh, he knew all about the Anthon transcript. He'd been consulted before. And he says, it's like this. And he brought out two big books and opened them up and on the table in front of me. And he says, what's the difference between the two? And I said, the first is like our cursive writing. The characters all connected. The others, they just stand isolated on the page. And he said, the bottom is Egyptian, the top is Meroitic, which is an upper Nile language that used Egyptian characters but is recognizable to scholars as, 
as Egypt as a Meroitic. So uh, it seems to me that that practice seems to be pointed at, and since it's so well known, uh, it's uh, an assumption, but not an unlikely assumption that that's the way it functioned. Yeah, yeah. That, you see, is another interesting challenge. What is Laban doing with this elaborate set of scriptures in his household? Do great men have libraries are there, uh, where they collect uh, documents of their, of their times? Um, there are examples of great libraries here and there through the Middle East. Uh, the Near East, but not uh, in Jerusalem. So it's another question on, on the docket of what he's doing with those brass plates. A huge task to put them together and to require great wealth, you know, many, many years of labor to, to write. So it's, it's a great question, I think. Yeah. I don't. I think, it's, um, I think it's a very good question. The practicalities of getting enough characters on those plates, getting enough sheets, and then being able to carry them. What, the estimate is what? There were 40 or 50 pounds. But if you had pure gold, it would be, be heavy. Emma referred to thumbing the plates, and they rustled like thick paper. I mean, that is really pounding metal thin. So this summer I've contracted with a metallurgist to be part of the summer seminar and try to investigate all these questions, discover what the practicalities are. Right now it seems to me like a huge problem and I don't know how we're gonna, how we're gonna get around it. Yes? Right. Yeah, I refer to that. You pound and pound it, and uh, pretty soon uh, that sort of wears away the copper patina, and you get down to that uh, that gold appearance. Yeah, right. How did old English come out? Yeah. Why not? Why not do old English? Yeah. Well, you know, there are 90,000 citations of more than three words from the Bible in the Book of Mormon. Uh, it's very close to the same percentage in the Doctrine and Covenants. The language Joseph Smith wrote, revelations are prophetic. Even his letters are laced through uh, with that language. When he wrote a private letter to Emma, it's not there. He writes just plain, ordinary English. But whenever he wrote, writes in that exalted vein, that's the, the language that he used. And of course, it serves a very useful purpose. Functionally, you can see that if this book is presenting itself as another Bible, an extension of the Bible, using that language is the natural language to, to uh, communicate with people of, the, of that age. But it's, a, it's an incredible gift. I mean, you, you can say it's some powers of his mind, or you can say that's the way God reveals things to his prophets. But that certainly is the language he used all the time. The uh, Muslims have a tradition that the original copy of the Quran is in heaven maintained by angels on gold plates. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I certainly will deal with it. I didn't know it. I'm writing it down right now. I think, I think that, that's marvelous. Um, I would very much like, like to have that. Uh, gold is such an interesting element. Gold, 
Bible. Because gold, on the one hand, is glory. It's the color of God in the Roman church. But it's also greed. It's the gold bug. It's the gold rush. So it combines this sort of very worldliness, mundane uh, kind of impulse with the holy and the, the sanctified. So it interests me, whenever I see gold being used to exalt an object, that becomes of, of great interest to me. Someone in this room can answer that question better than I. I don't think there's much Hebrew found in America. Has anyone got any information on that? Mark, do you know? No. No, no Hebrew. There's such an urge to find Hebrew in America that Mormons are always you know, finding some little passage that, ah, that must be Hebrew. But I, I don't think it's, uh, it's to be found. Uh-huh. What's the stone? Bad Creek stone. There's a disputes about its authenticity. That's always trouble. It's something you dig up in the modern age. It's like the kinderhook plates. Are they real or are they, are they not real? But you have to keep them in your mind. Has that been written up in a scholarly journal? Yeah, these things always are subject to so much dispute. You can go one way or the other. You have to kind of keep yourself in suspension as you look at them. I do think we want to be careful about putting too much trust in unsteady evidence. We, it's fine to consider it, but we don't want to say we've nailed it down unless it's really gone through the scholarly mills and we've judged it. Or um, it, it leads to embarrassment and disillusionment uh, later on. We all know this Thomas Stewart Ferguson story. We don't want to, we don't want to perpetuate any more lives like that, that one. That would be terrific, yeah. The plates, what's on those plates is very, very complicated. You try and figure out what really is on the plates and where it occurs, it's a harder job than you might, might think. So if anyone get that, that straightened out, it would be marvelous. Michael, another. I thought that was my mission in life, to drive <laughs> scholars crazy. Um, there are a number of things in our history, like seer stones and gold plates, that are just borderline embarrassing to us. 
um, because these are so far outside sort of the standard view of how the world works. And um, we ourselves tend to exalt them. We don't want to have Joseph Smith looking in a hat as a seer stone when he translates. We want him sitting there. We've got all these pictures of him sitting there with his hand on the gold plates writing down the translation like he was a King James Version scholar uh, writing down the Bible. Um, I want to bring the gold plates out of hiding, and I want to show that they're a powerful, resonant, sacred object that can be linked with other sacred objects in other religions of Islam and its Kabbah and all the uh, other sacred objects down through history, and that it has profound religious meaning. And I think that our very interest in those plates, which we've pursued assiduously as scholars and in other ways, uh, needs, that story needs to be told. And at the end, I hope that people, instead of thinking it, of the gold plates as si slightly silly and a clear evidence of Joseph's fraud, will seem rich and deep. They may not believe in it, but I want to show that those gold plates are rich and deep and that it's a worthy emblem for a, a religion to place emphasis on. Whether that will pre please them or not uh, remains to be seen. We'd love to know the number of, of plates, but uh, we don't. We don't, don't even know what the word sealed means. Does that just mean that they were not to be looked at? Like sort of this was the seal of the prophets, don't look at those, or were they actually bound together in some way that you couldn't get through them without cutting? Uh, so there are lots and lots of, of questions. The question, question was, did Joseph Smith ever indicate how many pages or leaves there were in the sealed portion and I suppose in the unsealed portion? The unsealed yeah, the unsealed that he translated. And I don't know an answer to that question. I don't think so. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, I should have been repeating the, um, Brother Gordon, no, you're Brother Gordon, I don't know, Strong? Okay, said that there is a stone that can be located on which it appears something like the Decalogue was written in Hebrew. And he wasn't exactly sure of the reference, but he said it was written up in a magazine somewhere. Do you know more about that? Yeah. Okay, so it's a question of um, finding how much that, uh, that piece of evidence has been dealt with and evaluated uh, by scholars. All right, I think we're getting close to our end, but we'll take a few more questions. Yes? Absolutely. We need not be the least bit embarrassed by seer stones. We're told in the Doctrine and Covenants that everyone who enters the celestial kingdom will be given a seer stone. This is part of the Lord's revelatory technology. We just have to accept this fact. And in the age of sitting with a little box with a glowing screen filled with information, we of all people should not sneer at seer stones. <laughs> it's just that... <laughs> We're just a few steps ahead of Steve Jobs, so. We, yeah. <laughs> yes.
Yeah. All right, that's a very good, that's a religious question. I think that's a significant one. Um, do we really need, or would it be good for us to have proof of these things so that everyone would have to bow down and say, you got us, you've got real proof? Or would somehow that undermine the whole human enterprise of having faith in things that are not, not seen? And uh, uh, this questioner went so far as to say maybe um, the angels above are keeping us away from the evidence. So if you went back to that deck log stone, it may have disappeared to, uh, by the next time you get there. The three Nephites came through with a road rock crusher and, uh, <laughs> and sent, it, sent it off. So, um, see, I'm, I'm one, one with you on the impulse behind the, that question. Um, our task in life is to listen to the good forces within us. And if it's all sort of thrust on us as we're coerced by overpowering evidence to accept something, that doesn't give us a chance to choose what's good and true. Uh, inside ourselves. So I like the intent of that question. Yeah. Yeah. The, the question, question is what are the contents of the plates of Darius? I don't know. Do you know, Mark, what? Yeah. Sorry, I can't answer that question. Plates of Darius goes down in my, my list, along with the gold plates of the Quran. Yeah. Well, uh, yes, one more question, then we'll come to an end. Yeah. 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 That is a very useful comment because we have to. Re okay, the, that the, the plates of Darius contain a, an account of Darius as his his king. It's. That's a powerful influence for writing history, to sustain a regime, to sustain and glorify a monarch. And that gives you adequate motive. And frankly, that, I think, is what Nephi is doing. He, the book of, of, of first and part of second Nephi is a founding document. It's justifying the founding of this nation and ripping all these things away from his, his brothers. So it's, I think it continues on with that, that kind of regal impulse to, uh, to write histories. Well, um, yes, one more follow-up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, making a comparison to uh, certain mes Central American records that are an account of the kings and is the Book of Mormon another version of that, an attempt to say, here is our people, this is our record, this is how God worked with us. I like that, that way of thinking, I think it leads a long ways. What I would just say in conclusion is that um, there's endless depths in all of these records, in the text, in the plates themselves, and groups like this which explore them, that are curious, who want to understand them, I think uh, are a powerful and uh, incentive and really a testimony to the, the cultural force of Mormonism in our lives. And I say this in the name of Christ. Amen.